All right, it's 10 o'clock. Y'all want to get started? I got a lot of stuff we can talk about today and some demos and everything. So um, if y'all are ready, we'll go ahead. Uh, my name is Mark Metallic. i am uh, been a ham for 15-ish years, something like that. Um, really like playing on VHF, UHF a lot, and uh, really like playing with digital radio and a lot of new technology. So trying to uh, show some of, this, uh, some of this new one. DMR is probably one of the, the newer digital modes out there. I know there's, there's lots of different modes. Um, and today in the presentation, I'd like to kind of talk about kind of how it compares with some of the other modes and some of the, the benefits of DMR um, versus some of the other ones uh, and the downfalls and kind of our user experiences, what's available here in Oklahoma, and uh, try to give a demo and certainly answer any questions that hopefully uh, you hopefully all have. <coughs> um, so what is DMR? Uh, DMR, like a lot of these other ones, is a published standard. Uh, doesn't mean that the, it's fully open source or anything. I know there's some amateur stuff that is fully open source. Uh, the, um, the, the chip that's in every radio is proprietary, just like every other digital mode that's commercial, I should say. P25, D-Star, Fusion, all those in the same way. But uh, this is a standard. The, the main benefit of DMR is it's not just one manufacturer. I know D-Star has a lot of benefits to amateur radio, however, there's only one manufacturer right now that really makes them. Uh, there's over half a dozen, and I think it's more, it's closer to 10 or 11 right now, of uh, these DMR radios. Um, the, some of the older digital modes, eh, the voice is a little shady sometimes. I think the voice quality is much better on these newer ones. Um, the battery life is much improved. Uh, the, uh, if you're not scanning, scanning, I, I will tell you, will uh, slow your battery life quite a bit. Uh, the biggest benefit to DMR, and really the thing that sets it apart to me, is the multiple talk paths on one frequency. So that means you can have one repeater, and we'll give a demo here in a minute, and there's actually two people can transmit to the repeater at the same time and have two different conversations that are completely independent of each other. They won't interfere with each other, they don't hear each other. That's, that's the real benefit, so I'll get to that a little more in a minute. Um, the, uh, uh, data applications, you can text message, you can send commands to different things. Um, not a whole lot of amateur application there, but it's something fun to play with. <coughs> Excuse me. And most of the, um, most of the radios are commercial grade radio, which uh, I know the amateur radios are getting better, but uh, usually means it's a, you know, it's good performance radio. A lot of people say it's a bad thing because they're only UHF or only VHF but that does help with the uh, uh, interference that you may get on the radio, so it makes the filtering much better. So as I said, this is really two repeaters in one. Uh, usually, you have, if you wanted to do this on analog or any other digital, you have to have actually two different repeaters. You have some combining equipment, and you can share an antenna. And you have one frequency here and another frequency, and you have your two radio groups. With DMR, it's TDMA. It's time division multiple access. So you have one repeater, one antenna, no combining equipment, and every 30 milliseconds, it swaps back and forth on what person is talking. So uh, you remember your old AT&T phones when you get close to the speaker and it, you kind of hear it chattering? That's TDMA. These radios will do the same thing if you get close to a, a speaker. You can kind of hear it chattering. So that's what's remarkable to me. These radios I actually key up, talk for 30 milliseconds, de-key, listen for 30 milliseconds, key back up, listen or talk for 30 milliseconds and back, back and forth. Mm. And what's really neat about that is you can receive signaling while you're talking. So somebody, if say you have somebody interfering maliciously with your uh, repeater, you can actually de-key their radio while they're keyed up. It's pretty, pretty cool stuff. Um, we can actually uh, give a quick demo here, kind of how this works. Uh, there are three guys that have a DMR radio. Um, Hank and Tim and uh, Ken, you want to do it? Um, if y'all want to use, I'll, I'll turn this on. This is our uh, Oklahoma City repeater. If y'all can tune over to that one, it sounds like it's going to take off whenever I turn it on. So hopefully it's not too noisy for us. Um, but you can kind of see the, the lights on the front. Those that can see, the, the ones on the left side are for time slot one, and the ones on the right side are for time slot two. Um, so you'll be able to see when each of us keys up on each side. Uh, Hank, if you would talk to me on, let's say, OKC Local on time slot two. And Tim and, and uh, Ken, if y'all could talk on, say, North America. And it won't, 
we're not networked right here, so it's not going to go anywhere. I'm just telling them what channels in their radius to go. Y'all all have those channels, right? Yeah, you want to go ahead and talk? You can hear. So Hank will talk to me. A5VM, And you can see it's, it's keyed up and it's only transmitted on A. One of these other guys, that's uh, doing an ID right now. Uh, Ken, you want to talk real quick? And I'm on the same frequency on o Oklahoma City site. Um, you got the other. You have you have the other OKC. Sorry. So we have a lot of different. Re we have three repeaters in, in Oklahoma City right now, and this is one of them. It's supposed to be up on a tower, but it's down here because we're having some tower issues. So there's two that are active in Oklahoma City right now. <coughs> as soon as it gets over there. Yeah, just the the, the first OKC one. All right, so I'm on the same frequency, and those that can see the repeater, you can see the light light up. I'm on the same frequency. I get a light on top saying there's activity on that channel, but it doesn't, we don't hear it. Hank and I don't hear it at all. So the best thing is, Ken and Hank, if y'all could both talk, you'll hear Hank come over mine, and you'll hear it go over Tim's radio. And there's no interference between the two of them, and you should be able to see both lights light up. These, both these are on the receives. Are you talking? Go ahead. So there's there's DMR. Hank talking to me, DMR. and he can talk separately on there. So that's the that's the real benefit of of DMR over a lot of these other digital modes. I'm gonna turn this repeater off. For, it's too noisy. Wherever the switch is, there it is. <coughs> um, all right. Next up, talking about bandwidth, you hear a lot of digital modes, they talk about how small the bandwidth is. The traditional 25K is the analog, uh, the DMR is 12.5K, which is kind of the commercial standard right now. Um, like I said, the benefit is you actually are two, so you're kind of sort of getting six and a quarter K. And some of the other digital modes like D-Star say, well, there's six and a quarter K, uh, but if you really wanted to have two different people talking at the same time, there's still a guard band in there, and so you're really using a little bit closer to that 25K. We don't have a guard band because we're all on one frequency. I'll, uh, I'll put this presentation out. We have a Yahoo group. I'll put this out so if y'all can have that also. You're welcome to take pictures. <laughs> um, so digital, for those that have never used digital, uh, you probably didn't have a really great uh, audio example here, but uh, there's no hiss, there's no popping, there's no static. It's kind of like uh, a cell phone. You're either there or you're not. Um, you can have zero on the signal meter, uh, and the radio can still hear somebody talking. And it sounds like they're right next door to you. It doesn't sound any better if you're right next to the repeater or 30 miles away from the repeater. Um, the the newer stuff, um, like this this uh, DMR, uh, I think has a lot better range than the older technologies. It seems like the older ones, as that signal strength started going away, you started getting those little errors. And like on D-Star, the popular term is R2-D2. Oh, you went R2-D2 on me. It happens. I don't get that quite as much on, on DMR. Um, the cor error correction seems to be quite a bit better. Um, part of that, I think, is because of that bandwidth that you get. Uh, the battery life, like I said, um, we're using somewhere between 20 and 34 percent less battery capacity compared to uh, uh, the frequency division instead of the TDMA, uh, and some people claim 40 percent better with uh, compared to analog radios. Yes, sir. Is that because it's only the transmission duty cycle with us? Yes, that's exactly they're right. Doing like, they're doing like packets. Exactly. That's exactly what it is. Yeah, you're not transmitting the 100 percent of the time. Right. Now it does require some processing in between, so it's not a it's not doubling your battery capacity, but it is considerably better. Um, with the two slots, you can also do data and voice at the same time. So say you could have voice going in on one slot, and you could reserve slot two for data if you wanted. That's not necessarily how we have our stuff tech to set up, but that is a, a potential way to do it. Uh, if you do not network your repeaters, it also has another function that you can do dynamics mix, dynamic mixed mode. So whatever goes in is what comes out. So if somebody wants to use that as an analog repeater, they can go in, the repeater says, hey, there's somebody talking, they're an analog, I'm going to output analog. And it'll do a PL tone, everything, just like a regular analog repeater. 
And then if somebody comes in on digital, either slot one, slot two, it'll go through the repeater and back out the same. Uh, like I said, uh, all of our repeaters in Oklahoma are on the network, so we do not support this. If you turn on the network, that option goes away. But for any club, if you, I know the uh, Yesu Fusion repeaters are quite the, the hot topic now because of their price, and they are also a mixed mode, so it's very similar to that. Um, these are more expensive than the Fusions, and if you network them, you lose that capability. So I'm just trying to be completely honest. I'm not a salesperson for either way, so I'm just kind of telling you what's out there. Uh, the text messaging is another cool thing. You can uh, text message either a group or an individual. Um, it's pretty neat. You can, uh, we don't have anything like any automated stuff set up, but potential options are, you know, weather alerts, meetings, announcements, however. Uh, right now, I, you know, somebody's like, hey, can you, uh, can you call me? I'm like, well, I don't have your phone number. Can you text it to me? And you can text it to somebody without giving it over the air. And if you send it to that individual, unless somebody else has their radio program for your particular ID, they don't get it. So it's, it's a little bit of security, and you're not really trying to hide anything. You're just doing an individual thing. Yes, sir? When you say groups, or are these groups you define yourself up on them, A, X, and Y, or are they predefined groups? Um, you predefine groups. When, when groups, it's a, a talk group. I'll get into a little more of how the structure of the programming works, but a talk group is usually what we use. It's a, it's a, a multi-user group, I guess you can say, and whoever is selected on that particular group at that time would receive it. Does that kind of answer your question? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> uh, so the IP site connect is what we use. And we do link both slots. So technically we have two linked repeater frequencies uh, at every site. Uh, each of these represents a repeater. So in Oklahoma we have 12 repeaters right now for statewide. These are all our peers. They all go to a master, which we're actually using some software as our master, which is this bridging software. And we talk to another master in Texas, and we can talk to another master in New York, and Florida, and California, uh, Germany. We, we can talk to all kinds of different masters all over the place with that software that we have. Um, so if the software goes down, we can still talk within Oklahoma. If you completely lose internet connection, you still have a local repeater, but you can't talk you know, nationwide, statewide, anything like that. So. Uh, getting into the kind of radios, uh, Motorola's were kind of some of the first ones. Uh, their brand name is Moto Turbo. Uh, it's the same thing as DMR. Um, really, the difference is they have some signaling things, um, you know, remote kill and stun and some stuff like that that hardly any hands use. So the voice is completely compatible. Um, the older ones, and you can still find these, I, that's still what I use a lot, uh, 6500, 6550s. Uh, the newer ones, um, what are they? The, uh, there's 3500s, there's 50 or 7550s. There's lots of different handhelds out there. You can find them on eBay. Um, they have mobiles, the 4550s and the new 5550s. Same thing on eBay. The biggest problem with Motorola's um, is the software. You got to have their their proprietary software, and unless you buy it, it's somewhat difficult to get the key to program wideband stuff. So if you want to put any analog data in or in, analog channels in them you have to have a special key to uh, program wideband since all the public safety and commercial is narrowband now. Uh, the Gen 2 radios, like I said, these are the, uh, the newer ones. Uh, color display, they're pretty, same, same issues. Uh, some other vendors, um, Connect Systems is probably the big one. That's, I think Hank and these guys, that's what they had. Um, uh, they're very big in the ham community because they're inexpensive. Uh, I, honestly, I've used a couple of them, no complaints. They're, I wouldn't really say there's a degradation of quality. They're, they're great radios. They uh, actually seem, the 700s actually seem like they receive better than the Motorola, which kind of surprised me. Um, there are several, several different models. The CS700 is the one that a lot of guys that you'll probably talk to probably have because the 750s just came out. The 750 is very similar to the 700, just has more memory, so you can put in more channels, you can have more contacts. Um, and soon it'll be fully front panel programmable. Right now you can do some programming from the front panel, but not everything. Uh, the MD380 is another one that's made by TYT. Um, Hytera, Harris, all these radios down here, they have a huge selection of radios. Um, they're probably about the same price point as Motorola. A little bit easier to deal with for amateurs. Uh, Tate, I've personally never used any of those, but um, they look just like all the other ones. Curiesun. Uh, those came out a couple months ago. They, uh, they're pretty popular in the ham community as well. 
Um, there's lots of other vendors out there. I didn't, I didn't, certainly didn't list them all. Um, but to me, that's a huge benefit over DSTAR and some of these others is there's so many vendors. It's a lot similar, more similar to P25 where there's multiple vendors, but it's not quite the public safety pricing that uh, P25 is. Yes, sir. Does each, does each vendor have its own programming approach or is it a common program? Most of them are all, you have to have their own, their particular program. Um, all these Connect System ones, the programming software is free, so you just go on their website and download it. And they've, they've been very good about keeping it updated and fixing issues. Uh, Hytera, you buy, it's, it's similar to Motorola. You buy one program and it programs all of the Hytera radios, which is different. And Motorola does the same thing, which is different than any of their other product lines where you gotta buy one for this model and one for this model and one for this model. All the DMR stuff, you buy one per manufacturer and they work on all of them from what I've seen. So it uh, doesn't, uh, they don't plug and play between vendors very well. Um, the Motorola ones, like if you had a mobile and a handheld, you can drag everything over to the mobile and it works. Uh, but you can't drag a Motorola one to connect systems. It doesn't, doesn't quite work that way. So, uh, so talking about the amateur side, um, there's, there's several Motorola clubs um, that kind of get the, got this started. The, the group that we're uh, kind of a sub-partner with is called DMR Mark. Um, their website's down here, dmr-mark.net. There's a lot of good information. There's uh, maps, there's repeater directories, there's user directories. If you're not already a user, uh, we, we, get, we let them kind of manage the user accounts. Um, you don't really need a user account, but it's nice to have everybody, you, you don't put your call sign in here, it's actually a numeric ID, and they basically manage the, what's the numeric ID and who's the call sign. And that way you can program all those in your radio and when they key up, instead of seeing a number ID, you get a call sign and a name. Uh, right now, there's uh, over 500 sites between the US and worldwide. Uh, I have a map here in a minute. They're, they're all over the place. 100% uh, digital, like I said, once you network them, you lose that mixed mode capability. Um, but uh, there is voice and text messaging. Um, there's weekly nets, kind of different ones, different areas. Uh, I checked last night, there was uh, like 13,850 uh, registered users, so it's uh, certainly growing. It's really grown a lot in the last year. Yes, sir. Yeah, real quick, you touched on instead of registering a call sign, you assign a proprietary number. Or they they give a number and they have a numbering scheme. So if you went on their right now on their website and said I want to I want a number, they're going to ask what your call sign is and your name and what state and your home repeater. Is that basically giving you an IP address? Kind of. It's it's uh, it's not quite as it's not like D-Star, no. Uh, we don't, it doesn't have any of that routing like D-Star does. It's, it's really just a radio ID number. Um, we don't do any registration with, on the actual RF side of it. It's, on, it's only on the... How does it route? How do I, if I'm talking to Europe, how does it know it's me talking to Europe? Your, every time you key up, your number is transmitted to the system. And the system passes that along to everybody else. Every time you key up, it's, it's similar to D-Star, P25 and all that. Your, your ID will show up on the receiving radio. So it's like an IP address, it's just a... It's more like a serial number, I should say. They get a lack of caller ID when you call them or someone with a pop-up on the Yes. Screen. And if you... And it, you have to program in your radio. You program in your radio, so it's not like a MAC address because you can't really... Well, most people can't change their MAC address. You shouldn't change your MAC address. <laughs> um, uh, no, you shouldn't change your MAC address. Yes, we're not going to get into there. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, if you go on their website, like I said, their website's very helpful. Uh, lots, of, lots of good stuff. Uh, going into kind of how it works, we talked about talk groups a minute ago. Uh, they're really user groups. And so what we do, since the, the actually, to be honest, the repeaters are pretty dumb. They don't do very, they don't do hardly any routing like DSTAR. DSTAR does a lot of the routing within the gateway server. But on the back of this repeater, there's not a place for a gateway server. The back of the repeater, you basically just plug in Ethernet, and that's all you do. The, re the repeater doesn't do that much processing of where things go. That's what we use that bridging software and uh, the, the masters for. So what we do is we use different time slots, and there's different talk groups on the time slots. So for example, time slot one, talk group three is North America. Um, you, most people on their radio just name that North America. You don't even see the slot one, talk group three. You just see North America. And when you key up, your radio says, 
I'm on this frequency, on this time slot, on this talk group, and when it goes into the system, the bridge sees it and says, hey, this guy is trying to go here, I'm routing it to every other repeater in North America. Same on time slot one, talk group one, that's worldwide. When you key up on that, it's, it goes to the bridge and the bridge says, hey, I want to talk worldwide, and it talks to every repeater worldwide. Same on 13, it's just it's supposed to be in English. Slot two we kind of reserve for more local or regional area. So we use talk group two for local areas. Uh, in Oklahoma City, we, uh, the three repeaters are networked together on local. We call that a local area. Uh, we also have um, a statewide talk group. We have a central Oklahoma talk group, and there's one talk group that talks between Texas and Oklahoma. So you have a couple different options. So on, on D-Star, you either have to pick a new reflector, uh, or if you're routing to somebody, you can talk directly to them, but most of the time, most people are on reflectors. These are kind of like, every time you push to talk, you're on a different reflector if you want to. Every time you turn the channel, one channel is like a reflector kind of deal. So. So, yes, sir. So it's the routing system that's actually sending and routing that information. That's, that's right. It's just exactly. Your radio is just, actually, to be honest, if it was straight up a Motorola system, everything that goes across every talk group goes to every repeater on the network. Okay. So that's what that software basically cuts it and says, nope, that part stays here. It so doesn't. on the back side of this, what is there? A router and what else? It's just, uh, it's actually just an Ethernet port. There's. No, what do you plug it into? Uh, yeah, you plug it into a router and just straight onto the internet and uh, off so it goes. Where's, so where's the software installed? Uh, we have it on a cloud server is where ours is. Um, it's, uh, it's got to somehow talk to that software, so you can right. plug it into it. It's programmed into here. Like, it's the same place you put in the frequency and the, all that stuff. Okay. Uh, it has, who's my master? And you put in the IP address of your master, and that's, that's pretty much it. Yes, sir? So if I set up to listen to worldwide English, mm -hmm. then if I have my radio on sitting on the table, anyone in the world who's talking English on that channel can go here. For the most part. That one's a little bit tricky because we have some that are user activated talk groups. So we don't our group is not on the receive list unless you keep if you kerchunk it real quick and then let your radio sit there, yes, that's exactly what'll happen. But our bridging software says there's so much activity on there that we don't want to hear it all the time. So if you're interested in it, kerchunk it, and it'll stay active for a little while. And after so long, it'll cut the link. Is there a throughput issue if you have too many people in worldwide talking? Uh, there is only because of the way it's set up. If you think about it, uh, we, we have these, I think I have a, if anybody keys up on global, it keys up 500 repeaters across the world. If anybody keys up on North America, it keys up about 300 repeaters in North America. Those are both on the same time slot. Only one can actually win. So we try to keep North America on most of the time, and there's a lot of discussion right now um, on do we want to keep that full time all the time, or is that going to be a, active, a user activated group as well? But basically, those are, and, and they don't necessarily hear each other. Because if you're in Europe, you don't know if somebody's active in North America because you're not receiving North America. So there is priority systems over. Usually it's first in, first out. So if somebody keys up on North America, say, say Hank keys up on North America right now, and in five seconds somebody keys up in Great Britain on Worldwide, I'm not gonna hear the Worldwide one because Hank has, Hank has the floor. You know, nobody, nobody can interrupt him there. So there is a buffering? There, really there, there's, a, there's, a, there's a little bit of buffering. There's some signaling between the, the uh, bridging software and it will tell the guy, well, if he's really talking, actually, it works more if you're on the same talk group. If you're on North America and I'm on North America, there is a little delay. It's actually a lot better than what I would think. Um, if we both key up very close to the same time, whoever gets into the server first wins, and the other guy, even though he keyed up and he may have gotten a talk permit, it will tell your radio, stop talking, because you didn't, you didn't make it, and, and you'll start hearing the other guy talk. So that's part of the other cool thing with the signaling when it's not transmitting 100% of the time. So, yes, sir. How are you making the link to the North America? Is that an RF link <coughs> separate from the repeater? That's all IP. From the repeater to everything else is all IP. Yes, sir. It's all internet. Yep. Um, and how you get to the internet? There's a lot of different clubs <laughs> doing different things. Uh, some people are using cellular. That's probably the the quickest, easiest thing to do. There's some people trying to do their own subnets, you know, wireless networks between buildings or towers within an area. Um, there's some people tied into the public safety side of things. It's just kind of 
t whatever you have available at your tower is usually how it kind of works. Uh, let's get back. So here's, here's all, and I actually missed the last repeater. When I gave this uh, two months ago, there was only 11. We have a new one here. These are all the different areas. So Newcastle, Bartlesville, Tulsa, Tulsa has two. We have, uh, we have three in Oklahoma City now. I count Newcastle as Oklahoma City. Uh, Fort Gibson, uh, Keatonville, Stillwater, Manford, Mounds, Ponca City. Those are all the repeaters. And here's a list of all the tall groups we use. So everything above that line, those are all the ones on time slot one. So whenever we were talking about time slot, it's just like any other repeater. You can only have one person talking on a time slot at a time. You can't have two people on a single time slot. So it'll, it'll give you a busy if you uh, try keying up on these, on these uh, repeaters. Uh, kind of talked about this. What this is really meant to show is how many repeaters are on whenever you key up. So on local, there's not very many repeaters. That's kind of the local area. Most repeaters in the state, if you key up on local, it's only that repeater. Oklahoma City or Tulsa are the only ones that we have. Uh, Oklahoma City has three. Tulsa has two when you key up on local repeaters. The club area we're not really using yet, but that's a potential future option. Sub-regional we do use. We have a central Oklahoma and a eastern Oklahoma. So central Oklahoma right now includes uh, the Oklahoma City area and Stillwater. And if you key up on eastern OK, it keys up pretty much uh, Ponca City, all the Tulsa area, Manford, the that, that whole area over there, everything else. Uh, we have a statewide that keys up all 12 repeaters whenever you key up on it. And then we have a regional that we share with Texas. Uh, however, Texas also has a statewide. So if somebody's talking on Texas when you key up on there, that audio won't get routed to Texas. It just stays statewide. So um, the, the bridging software tries to assign priorities as much as it can. So Mark, just for clarification, mm -hmm. the three that are online are Newcastle, downtown, and the one that's currently sitting right there. Yes. This is supposed to be up north. Yeah. That's yeah. The right. That's uh, this one, 442.625. Uh, kind of our coverage through the state, um, that's our uh, current coverage. Actually, I need to update the Oklahoma City area. We cover a little bit further north now. <coughs> We've got a pretty good site in Stillwater. You can see the uh, eastern part of the state is uh, much larger coverage. Um, looks really good. And uh, Ponca City, there's one up here. I hadn't added the coverage map on that. Uh, closer into Oklahoma City, here's kind of our coverage. The uh, orange is uh, what we cover with Newcastle. The green is only covered by the uh, downtown site, and the, the yellow is you can get either repeater at the time. So, so here's downtown right here. We're somewhere right about here. Um, you can find your find your home on there and uh, see if what uh, repeater could work for you and what uh, what you could expect as far as coverage around here. If I'm going from on 44, let's say down by New Newcastle, and I'm going up to like Northwest Express, I'm going to have to change. To uh, if you're on expressway, maybe. Um, and that's, that's one of the other benefits of some of these radios. Motorola has a feature called roaming. You can set it up to automatically find what the best site is. It's similar to their trunking stuff, except there's no control channel that it, it listens. It just listens to what the received signal of, of the repeater is as you use it. And it'll automatically change sites. Uh, there's some people who say that that's not, um, that's not allowed in amateur radio because you don't, it's automatically changing the frequency and you did an ID on the last one, but if they're linked together, you're still coming over that frequency, just the input frequency is the only one you did an ID on, so. Do they, are they considered that tier three? Is that what uh, this, no, that's still tier two. It's still tier two. Yeah, three is like full yeah. trunking, yeah. Yeah. Yep. That is for downtown, yes sir. Very it is. That's more handheld yeah. on a rubber duck. You get pretty solid coverage out there, and that like a big spot you're showing there. Up, up here? Yeah. 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 Hank, yeah. you live because you live somewhere right in here, don't you? Yeah, and I'm operating that dead spot, no problem. Longer. Just with the with the rubber duck or with the mobile no, antenna? No, oh, you're talking rubber duck. Yeah. These, yeah this I is a propagation. True for rubber duck. Yeah. So a lot of people just have handhelds with a mobile. Yeah, it's it's yeah. considerably better coverage. Uh, kind of talking about how the east and the west works. Actually, that line is wrong. I, sorry about that. Uh, east is all these repeaters. So Manford Mounds, Tulsa, Keatonville, Muskogee. Um, and actually, if you're traveling east on 40, you're like, there's no repeaters down here. As soon as you get east of Shawnee, you actually start hearing mounds. And you get over here, and you can start using Muskogee. You, can, you can't quite get to the Arkansas border, but there's, uh, there's very good coverage going that way. 
Um, so the nearby area, here's, uh, here's kind of a showing of all the repeaters, the DMR repeaters. Um, I have a, a D-Star one next, but West Texas is covered fairly decent. Um, you know, it doesn't look like they have very many, but uh, the other day I was driving from Lubbock to Amarillo, and I could use a Lubbock repeater when I was in Canyon, so it's nice and flat out there. So um, you can see all of ours in, in Oklahoma. North Texas has quite a few. Um, it hasn't really caught on in Central and around Houston area yet. They're uh, still working on it. Um, if I'm going to make your problem, I'm not going to be able to reach out to Scobie and repeat it. I couldn't tell you that. Paul, do you know? Where'd he go? I'm back here. I don't think you can get some Scobie if I'm going to find a lot. When I, when, I was, when I was driving I-40, it was somewhere around on the on the east side of Henrietta. I could start getting into the Muskogee, but I don't I don't know about on the lake. Uh, if you compare that to the D Star system, there are more D Star uh, repeaters in some areas. Um, it's kind of hit or hit or miss either way, really. Does DMR have an evap type device? Not not currently. No, you're welcome to design one. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, if you look at a, a nationwide map, here's the DMR. It's really caught on in California, Arizona, at least most of Arizona. Uh, the East Coast has considerable amount of repeaters. Um, there's quite a few, uh, quite a few around. There's certainly still some blank spots on the map, but uh, overall, it's caught on pretty well, considering it's really only been pretty mainstream ham for probably about three years, two to three years. What are the different colors? Uh, those are kind of different clubs. So each each area or network, we talk, kind of talked about those bridging software. So we have our own bridge here. Texas has a br East Texas has their own bridge. West Texas has a bridge. Arizona has a bridge. Actually, the Colorado repeaters aren't showing on here. They kind of play on their own terms, but they link in some talk groups. Um, Kansas, we actually help, or Kansas helps us get on to the nationwide. So our stuff actually goes to Kansas first, and then from Kansas it can go anywhere. Um, so that, yeah, the different colors are really kind of the different bridges that they're on. Uh, compare that to a D-Star map, kind of the same thing. Uh, big, big holes in some areas, but uh, southeast, east, west is covered pretty well. Uh, look at a worldwide map. So Europe is really caught on. Uh, there's quite a few in Australia. Hawaii, there's one on every island if y'all ever want to go out there. Um, but uh, pretty, pretty impressive growth for uh, just a couple years. Uh, kind of talk about programming here. Uh, so just like everything else, you need a frequency first, um, repeater input, repeater output, just like, just like a regular uh, analog radio. Then we're going to do color code. Color code is really similar to tone. It's a number from 0 to 15. That's all it is. And the repeaters uh, ask for it um, whenever you program them as well. Um, almost everything in the state is on color code one. Uh, some of the Tulsa ones are on two, but most everybody uses one because that's the default. Then the first thing that's different from analog radio is the time slot. So you have to pick time slot one or time slot two. Your radio, uh, you got to tell it that to basically tell it which, which area to talk on. Then you have talk group, which we kind of discussed a little bit. What group of people are you talking to? Really, if you wanted to, you can actually set up a channel on your radio to talk to an individual instead of a group. So similar to the text messaging, you can do an individual talk. Uh, also, most people set up a receive group list. So we talked about all these talk groups. And what, the way I like to set my radio up is I set the frequency, I set the color code, and I set the time slot. And I set a receive group list to be everything that's on those time slots. That way I'll hear if there's any other traffic. It's kind of like a scan, but you're sitting on one channel. Uh, so like, for example, on time slot two, I usually leave my radio on local to listen to everybody, but if there's somebody on statewide, I want to hear it. So I can hear everything on that time slot if I set up the receive group list correctly. Uh, the other thing that does is let you know if that time slot is busy. That's true. It does. Right. Because your signal meter will show signal and it'll, the light will blink if there's activity on the other time slot. But you, yeah, you don't, you won't know if it's on that slot. Right. Yes, sir. So if I'm connected to one of our repeaters here, and I specifically want to talk to a Phoenix repeater, how do I do that? Okay. So there's, um, I didn't let me go back up here. I didn't, I didn't really get into the detail on some of these. Uh, we have some dynamic talk groups also. 
uh, similar to like the, the reflectors in D-Star, TAC 310, 311, 312. Uh, not every repeater in the U.S. supports them, but most of them seem like they're, they're kind of going that way. So right now, kind of the way most people do it is either if you have a time, you're going to go to 310 with your buddy and say, hey, you know, kerchunk it, and our systems will be linked together. Uh, a lot of people are meeting on North America and saying, hey, it's just you and I talking. Nobody, you know, we don't want to tie up the whole 300 repeaters. You got 310, we'll go over to 310, and then you can carry on your QSO on 310. Is, is there a website where I can verify and see that I'm connected? Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, there's actually, there's uh, similar to D-Star, there's a, uh, a site that you can actually go see all the active, act, all the activity currently going on. It looks like that. And so every time somebody keys up, it has their duration, where they're at, what their call sign is, what bridge group they're on, what their signal strength is, the site they're on, and if they have any data loss. So it's, it's pretty... Uh, That's dynamic. Uh, it's dynamic. It's a Java application, so I'll share that here in a second. Uh, going back to, to the programming, uh, like I said, we, we have all these things to program. The different manufacturers, they kind of all have their different thing. This is a screenshot from the uh, Connect System 700, the CS700, or the MD380 software. Um, you can kind of see all the options. Um, the Motorola is uh, quite a bit different layout, but that's the same kind of screenshot as what theirs is. You got your receive, your transmit. Here's your group list. Here's your contact name. You can do all kinds of other options. Uh, closer to the top has where all the um, uh, time slot or whatever is. Talking about the ID scheme, we talked about Oklahoma. Uh, right now, DMR supports a whole ton of IDs. Um, most, most everybody just needs one ID. Um, there's a couple of us have two just for other special purposes. Um, the uh, seven-digit IDs are what we give everybody. In Oklahoma, the prefix is 3140. The three is U.S. Actually, 31 is U.S. 40 is what state number Oklahoma is alphabetically. And uh, then there's a three-digit code on the end. That's your unique individual code in Oklahoma. So even if you don't have somebody's ID on, the, uh, on your radio, like where it'll show up is their call sign, you can, you can still kind of figure out what state they're in based on the first four digits. Um, Repeaters get an ID also. Um, then, then we get into talk groups. So the four-digit talk groups, like uh, 3140, is our Oklahoma statewide talk group. So your radio ID and your regional talk group usually match up. Um, then we have country talk groups. Um, there's, we don't actually have a U.S. talk group. It's more of a North America. We, we talk to the Canadians a lot. <laughs> um, let's see. So we talked about this, uh, this website. Uh, if you just search for uh, DCI Seabridge Netwatch or Netwatch DMR, usually you pop up with this. And uh, it's, it's pretty fun to you can kind of sit there and watch. You see all the, these are the current people as I screenshot of that. Uh, this is all the, the history and it has um, quite, a bit of, quite a bit of history if you want to kind of go through. So um, that's kind of all I had for, uh, for the main presentation. Um, certainly welcome more questions. Uh, we can get some more demonstrations. Yes, sir? Mark, I know the, the CSI will, but with the other radios work analog also? That's something that people have been asking. Uh, you can. Not on, not on the same channel. Like if you have a particular channel, yeah. it will not do dynamic mix mode on that channel. Right. You can program an analog channel and a digital channel right next to each other. You can scan between them, but and they will transmit on either one, but it's set up per per channel. So yes, yeah, I, I don't... There, there's, on, there, there's only one that I know of that will not, and it's a Motorola SL7550, and it is digital only. No. Yes, sir. Uh, it's just 5440. Yeah. There, there is two meter. We don't have any two meters in Oklahoma. Um, the, the two meter, the, the, the VHF repeaters are pretty much only in New England right now, just because of their uh, offset. It's rain, off, it's off, well, it's. Yeah, it works. It works well, but you know, honestly, um, we we have some pretty decent sites on on UHF, and I haven't really seen any real detriment to being UHF. Um, it's easier to get a repeater pair on UHF. I think that's why it's kind of gone that way most of this, most of it. So, um, and like I said, the repeaters. I mean, the the subscriber radios. None of them are dual band yet. Um, so it's kind of nice that Hervise kind of standardized. So if you travel between here, Kansas, Texas, Colorado, they're all UHF. But, you know, a lot of people saying that, you know, like just using a handy token with the rubber duck hat. 
halfway of uh, UHF antenna, it's only going to be about that that's, that's true. That's true. That's, that's exactly right. Right. And they work pretty good around buildings and in town and everything, yeah. too. So, yes. Sir. Uh, this is a Motorola repeater. Um, I said that uh, there's multiple manufacturers. A lot of the other manufacturers do make the repeaters, but right now, if you want to be on the ham network, they only support the Motorola linking protocol. Uh, this one uh, is around $2,400 for just a repeater, then you add duplexer and all that. Um, I've uh, tried to talk to a lot of clubs and saying, hey, you got an old repeater that's falling apart. Let's pop one of these in here. All you do is, you know, it's plug and play if you can do it that way. Um, there are some dealers that offer ham-friendly pricing. So if you're if you're interested, you know, talk to me after the meeting. I'll give you some of the guys that, that we've dealt with to, to get. That's the commercial price kind of deal. So, yes, sir. How bad would you have to have free rent and provider work um, It really depends on how the bridge is set up. Right now, how we're set up, um, you probably. I'm set up on it, like you call it. Uh, you probably need. Not on the dial but almost it's DSL. Uh, DSL would. I don't think we have any on DSL right now. The the bigger problem is latency. Um, they they want less than I think it's 250 millisecond latency, uh, but it's I think it's 100k both ways. Is what that's right. I think that's that's kind of the absolute minimum. More is better, but but yeah, I think if you can reliably have 100k and less than you know. Say 100 to 200 millisecond is kind of that should should work. So, sir. What else? Oh. The country talk group. <laughs> uh, probably North America. You probably fit right in. <laughs> yes, sir. So I'm sure this is very similar to uh, other digital uh, radio setups, but. Analog is like one and a third times the distance for the range on it. What do you mean? I know that chart shows one and a third uh, times the line of sight distance. Oh, okay. So for digital, what is that? Is it similar to that? Or um, less or what? I hadn't really heard a rule of thumb like that. Um, I would say, like, we have uh, one of the Newcastle one is on a similar side as a uh, as a UHF analog, and the UHF analog is about couple feet taller or higher up on the tower and I'd say it's pretty similar coverage of where I can hear both of them. So it's probably probably the same kind of rule of thumb. The, but the, the big difference is when you get to that fringe area and the analog, you know, you can't hear it, it'll be there and then all of a sudden it's gone. Yeah. So. I see the state map again. <coughs> sure. The coverage one, or just where yeah. that one? Yeah. Okay. Like I said, we. Orange down there by the lake is there. We can barely. All of that is all of that is rubber. It's all through. Yeah, this is all propagate. Uh, if you give me your email afterwards, I'll give you one for. I can give you one with mobile coverage. Any other questions? Yes, sir. You guys play around any with the uh, text protocols within the DMR system, sending messages, information? Um, I've sent it from the radio, but I haven't, you know, you're talking about like doing it from a server or to a massive group or anything. We haven't, I hadn't really broken it down like that, but radio to radio and to a group works really well, actually. Um, to a group, to a group, you don't get a uh, acknowledgement. But if you send it to an individual, you get an acknowledgement, just like APRS and everything. It it acts it back and says, "Yeah, I got it." So. What about between different brands of radios? Uh, it it really seems like it, it seems like it works well. Yeah, I can send it from a Motorola to a Connect system. Uh, from I have a Hytera also. It works great with Motorola. Um, haven't haven't seen anything. The the voice and the the texting seems to work great between all the different vendors. Even most of the the special options like. Uh, um, radio, like you can page your radio, uh, like a remote call, you can do a private call, all that stuff seems to work between vendors great. So um, even the radio disable and enable works between vendors. <laughs> yes, sir. This may apply only to the Motorola people in here, but are you physically using the roaming feature in Oklahoma City? Uh, we don't have the repeaters turned on to do roaming, but I have my radio set up for it and it still works relatively well. If you get time, send me that out. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it's uh, 
So like I said, the, we can if we turn it on the repeaters, basically they'll send out a beacon every 45 seconds, something like that. And that tells the radios, hey, here it is. Even if there's no activity, it still sends yeah, out a set beacon. Up another, uh, group no, no, nope. it just it just beacons and so it's kind of like the ID. It just gotcha. it's there. Your radio won't unswelch. It just if you're watching it, it just sees the signal and then it goes away. Gotcha. Um, we could set up between the three of them, but we've chosen not to. Just I think the Dallas area they have theirs turned on. Um, okay, the code plug or yeah, just the code plug. Okay, okay, yes, sir. You described it both as a published um, standard and as something that's not open but rather proprietary. Can you elaborate some on, on that? Is it a um, right you have to buy or or what? What is possible? With the um, so you can. You can write software that uh, talks to the protocol. The protocol is fairly open. There's people that have documentation on it. You can actually, the bridging software we're, we're doing is homemade bridging software. We, we have, we've broken down how it works between repeaters. Uh, but the IDs and some of the other stuff that goes into the, the actual header data, that's the closed stuff that we can't. It's, it's all encrypted between the manufacturer stuff. So. Um, so you could build your own radio, but you'd still have to buy the chip that actually encoded, decoded. Well, that's probably not entirely true. There's only part of the encode, decode that is proprietary. You can decode all day long. There's there's lots of software out there. Actually, if y'all are interested and don't have a radio, there's a program called DSD. You can have a disc, uh, packet audio in, or or you have one of those USB. Um, receiver things, you can decode it all day long. Uh, no license, no, no fee, nothing like that. Uh, if you wanted to encode, that's where the, the licensing and all that stuff kind of comes in, because uh, DVSI, which is the same company that makes the D-Star chips, the same company that makes P25 chips, same company that makes DMR chips, they're the ones that, uh, they hold the patent on that stuff. Do you have a web page? Do we have a web page? Uh, no. We have a Yahoo group, yes sir. It's uh, If you search for OK-DMR in Yahoo groups, uh, certainly uh, welcome discussion on there. Um, we, we also, if you have a radio, we keep a lot of uh, code plugs on there. So if you're new, you can just go grab a code plug and load it in your radio and it should work pretty well. So, um, And if you have questions about the system, most of the system admins are on there. You can ask away and we'll, we'll try to answer as best we can. <laughs> Is there a code plug with everybody's ID for the state? Yes, right now we're up to 160 when I checked last night. Um, I just loaded, put two of them on last night with the... Is it on your Yahoo? Uh-huh, yep, it's on the Yahoo group, yep. Any other questions? Paul? Hey, I don't know how many people are from uh, Tulsa in the eastern part of the state. I'm from Tulsa. If you have questions about specifically Tulsa, I'm pretty familiar with the eastern part. I'm happy to answer those questions if you want to yeah. stick around. Paul and I actually talked. He was on his way down this morning, and I was on my way to the ham fest, and he called out on statewide, and he's like, hey, I'm on route to the ham fest. I'm coming down I-44. Way up I-44. Yeah, and it sounds like he's on the same system. You don't really know what repeater he's on because it sounds the same. So. your contact Mine uh, is uh, just my name here. I'll just I'll text, type it out here. That way you don't... Uh, Whoops, I missed an L. There you go. You can get, did it disappear? I was trying to hide it, right? There you go. Can you get me right there? Like I said, I'll, I'll try to post this out on that Yahoo group. So if y'all want to, uh, it's a, you have to request to join, but we're usually pretty quick about getting people on there. So. I'll try to post that out there. If you have any other questions, I'll be around. Uh, we, if you're interested in a radio, we do have a couple of 750s still. Um, I know there's some other vendors in the flea market that have some of the 380s. I don't know if there's any more 800s. I don't know if he sold all his 800s or not, but um, there's there's some around if you're interested. If you just ham shop have one, so if you just want to come listen to it, we can flip it on North America and you can hear some activity too. So uh, there's six more 750s. So. Yep. The 750s uh, with the programming cable, uh, I'm selling them for 240. Uh, I think the the CS800 is a mobile version. I think they're what are they 290? 290. 290. 
Um, there's uh, what's the guy on the this side of the room? I think he has a couple more of the 380s. I think they're about 170. So the Connect systems and the Titeras are the cheapest entry point right now. So if you can, if you can wait, you can probably go on eBay with the 750s coming out. There's probably a lot of people wanting to get rid of 700. So if you want to really Good deal. Ask it. The memory, right? Yeah, it's the memory is the only. That's the that's the biggest difference. Oh. Yeah, and the front panel programming front eventually. Front has memory itself, right? It has a thousand. I'm not really sure. I think it's about a thousand. It's a it's a lot. Did you say well, you know, that sometimes the 750 will be able to hold every? They're so, they're making it. They're gonna. It'll be two thousand channels and sixty five thousand ID numbers. Oh. So it should be. It'll hold in North America for a little while, at least. <laughs> do, you know, do you know if Connect Systems is still going to be the body after the upgrade? Uh, he, st he still had a uh, thing on his website. You can send your 700 in, and it'll upgra he'll upgrade it to a 750. Uh, I heard somebody say yesterday it was like $40, something like that, but I, I haven't personally checked on it. So, yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, I assume that the uh, program is additional IDs are added and so forth. You don't have to reprogram your radio. I guess that gets downloaded and uh, If you want the new IDs, you have to program your radio. So whenever you key up, all that's sent over the air is a, is a number. Whenever you see it on your radio, your radio is actually saying, here's a number. Do I have that ID? If, if yes, here's what it says. It doesn't send you their call sign. It does not send you their call sign. That's right. That's, How quickly did you reprogram it? Um, I do it more whenever there's a new repeater in the area versus a new person. The, the numbers don't really bother me. You can, and most of the radios from the keypad, if there's a new person, you can still add them and put a, an alias on there. And when somebody calls you, they're supposed to still ID. Yeah, you still got to ID by voice. So it's still kind of the protocol. Kind of the right. Contact. Right. Well, and the, the other nice thing, if you're doing text messaging, you can scroll through and say, oh, there's Hank. I'm going to send him a text. Instead of Hank is number 142 or whatever. I don't even know. Is that what? I don't even know what number he is. So. Yeah. Okay. Good? All right. Well, thank you all for coming. Thank you.